Hi, this is Herb Shapiro with the Dr. Vax channel. And today, we're going to do something completely different. Uh, no, we're not going to build with children's toys. At least, that's not the focus of the video. Instead, we're going to talk about a different type of 3D printer. Most of the videos I've done on this channel that relate to 3D printers talk about FDM printers. FDM printers use a filament that is melted and extruded from a nozzle, a brass, a steel, a ruby nozzle, in order to build up prints layer by layer. Monoprice loaned me for a review a mini SLA printer. SLA printers use a resin, a photosensitive resin, that's why it's stored in this opaque container, in order to create prints. But before I do the review of the mini SLA printer, I thought it would be appropriate to introduce my viewers to a range of 3D printers, printers in the additive manufacturing industry, which is more or less the technical term for 3D printers. So hold on, stay tuned, and let's learn something together. To begin this video, let's talk a little bit about history. Because while 3D printing is in the news pretty much every day today, and it seems like it burst suddenly into our lives, in fact, it's an old technology. The original concepts around 3D printing were developed about 40 years ago, and I'm not very good at dates, so I wrote these down. In 1974, David Jones, wrote an article for New Scientist describing the concept of additive manufacturing or 3D printing. Then in 1984, 10 years later, 3D Systems, a uh, gentleman there by the name of Chuck Hull, one of the founders of 3D Systems, developed the first patent for commercially viable 3D printers. And in 1986, two years later, uh, 3D Systems introduced the SLA-1, the first stereolithography, SLA-style 3D printers. They were very, very expensive at the time, tens of thousands of dollars or more, and used strictly for prototyping in advanced manufacturing settings. Then, in 1992, Stratasys introduced the first FDM 3D printer, and they also had some patents on FDM 3D printing. And during that era, in the 80s and 90s, there were a limited number of companies making 3D printers because they had patents on all the key technologies. But then something interesting happened because in 2009, the patents began to expire, specifically the patents first on FDM printers, and you saw consumer grade 3D printers produced, first by companies like MakerBot, and that led to hobbyists um, gaining access to these printers. Over the last few years, more and more of the patents have expired, and more and more companies around the world have begun producing 3D printers, both for very high-end manufacturing uses and for use in the home. So we're going to cover now a series of different technologies that are used in additive manufacturing in 3D printing. And we're going to, I'm going to show you some slides, some pictures, I'm going to talk about these to give you an understanding of the world of 3D printing, which is much broader than the world of printing vases out of plastic. Um, and in fact, 3D printers today are used to produce parts for aircraft, for spacecraft, for automobiles, and throughout uh, the, your consumer and manufacturing life. So let's look at some slides and get started. The first technologies we're going to look at, I call, I'm sort of classifying these technologies into three buckets, extruder-based technologies. These are technologies where you extrude either plastic or other materials, concrete. If you extrude concrete out of a nozzle and you lay it down in rows and then you build it up, 
you can 3D print buildings. So let's look first at an example of how this works, just so you have a way to explain to other people 3D printing. And in fact, this will demonstrate to you that 3D printing is much more than 40 years old. It's hundreds, if not thousands of years old, where the 3D printing machine was a human being. Let's say I have a couple bricks. I can put those down in a line, and then I can add additional bricks on top. The blue and the green bricks are my first layer of my 3D print. The orange and the yellow bricks are the second layer of the 3D print. Now here's when it gets interesting. If I continue to add on bricks, but perhaps, let's use this one here, perhaps instead of adding them on across the layer completely, I leave gaps in the layers, I can produce geometries, I can produce shapes that are very different than shapes that are made with most manufacturing processes. I just produced a 3D print that has an opening. Could be a window, could be a hole for a fastener, for a screw, for a bolt in this print. And I did that by printing layer by layer. And when I got to a certain layer, skipping areas in the layer, building it up, and then putting a layer over the top. When you put a layer of a 3D print over an open layer, that's called bridging in 3D printing. So using this process, I can take and I can print a variety of objects that are very functional because the hinges in this toy are just spaces where I've left a gap, I've bridged over the top, and I've connected them together. Likewise, I can produce traditional hinges using the same processes of additive manufacturing layer at a time. Now let's talk about the next type of 3D printer. Now, in this case, I'd like to talk about resin or powder-based solutions. So instead of using filament, these solutions have a vat, have a container that's filled with liquid resin. And then those liquid resins are set using a variety of processes. They can be set if they're photosensitive by using laser beams or even ultraviolet light. They can be set by using more powerful laser beams or electron beams that actually melt the materials and fuse them together. So let's look at a picture of how this would work. First here, we're looking at SLA, stereolithography. We have a vat filled with a photoreactive resin. A laser beam is directed into a mirror. The mirror is angled and rotated, is moved in order to focus or draw the laser on the bottom of the vat. The bottom of the vat is clear, so the laser is going to set or fuse the photosensitive material wherever it hits. In order to control the layer heights, we have a print bed that is pushed down into the vat. So if the print bed is 0.4 millimeters from the bottom of the vat, which is clear, then the laser beam is going to set 0.4 millimeters of material. Now, SLA printers are relatively complex. The mirrors have to be calibrated, the lasers have to be calibrated, they have to be focused. So that made them relatively expensive, tens of thousands, $50,000, $60,000. The prices started coming down as the cost of the laser technology came down, but also with the introduction of a simpler form of SLA printer. That's called masked SLA. So let's look at this next picture. In masked SLA, you still have a vat of photoreactive resin. You still have a build plate that's lowered into the resin, but underneath the vat, you have a LED grid with an LCD mask. 
What that basically means is you have a light source, LED light source, and on top of it, you have a screen that looks like the screen on your phone. And by setting pixels of the screen to black or clear, you can let light from the LED through. So basically with a masked SLA printer, you print a whole layer at a time because you light up a layer from underneath, individual dots, though those lights go through the base of the vat and they hit the build plate. The same concept if the build plate is 0.15 millimeters from the clear bottom of the vat, then that will be your layer height for that layer. This is a very interesting characteristic of masked SLA printers because since they expose a full layer at a time, they can in fact be much faster than traditional SLA printers that have to draw with a laser beam on each layer. Most of the low cost consumer SLA printers are masked SLA printers. Because if you go back to this picture, you'll see there are very few moving parts. Basically, you're moving your build plate up and down, and that's the only moving part in this printer. There are other types of fused materials, as I discussed. You ver use very powerful lasers or even potentially electron beams in the future in order to fuse materials. These are often used for printing in metallic materials. Now there's a third class of 3D printers. This third class is jetting technologies. In this technology, your print head is much more complex. It's more like the print head on a inkjet printer. And instead of squirting out ink, you're squirting out materials. Now there are two styles of jetting 3D printers. What we have in this case is a print bed on the bottom and a squeegee-like mechanism spreads a thin layer of powder on the print bed. Then the jetting head, think of it like a inkjet printer, moves back and forth over that power, squirting binder, a type of cement, into the powder. Where the drops of binder hit, it holds that powder in place. So you're creating a layer of time of a bound powder. As you move up, you create more and more of the object. When you're done, you do have to use a post-processing step in order to remove the extra powder and then to melt or synth or harden the model because what you've done is you've sort of temporarily tacked together particles of this powder. In material jetting, use a similar inkjet style printhead, but you're actually printing the mechanism a dot by dot. Now, in some ways that seems similar to FDM printing, but in FDM printing, you're not going dot by dot. You are melting and extruding lines of material. Because material jetting uses very fine dots, it can produce objects that have very fine finishes. It can also produce objects in multiple colors because potentially it can jet or, or sort of print out multiple colors just like an inkjet printer. So we've talked about three general classes of additive manufacturing. FDM, fused deposition modeling, in which case we're melting a filament or extruding a material a line at a time and building them up. We then talked about SLA style printers where you have a vat of material and you shoot either a laser or an ultraviolet light at this photosensitive material. That's what's in this particular uh, container is photosensitive material. The UV light sets that material and you build up your print a layer at a time. Now, when you use photosensitive material, when you're done, you also have to post-process it by exposing it to UV light for a longer period of time. 
the exposure that's in the printer is just enough to sort of solidify it so it will hold together, but it's still more or less soft or fragile. By exposing it to even more light, you harden that material. You can do that by putting it outside in the sunlight or by using a standalone light, which is what we'll do here. And then the third style of printer uses a more complex head. Instead of extruding lines of material, it extrudes very fine droplets. These can be binders that hold a powder together, or they can be material itself and can be used to make multicolor materials. Well, folks, I hope this short video introduced you to some concepts. Please come back in the next couple days because I am going to do a review of the Monoprice Mini SLA printer. That printer was loaned to me by Monoprice. I didn't pay for it. They also provided me with uh, the resin materials so that I could do a view for you. Thanks so much. Give me a thumbs up if this was interesting. Recommend it to other people. Subscribe to the channel. Click on the bell. And most importantly, leave comments so we can continue to learn together.